Hi, I'm Mitch Parker, Information Security Officer at IU Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. And today's topic is going to be advancing medical device security, how collaboration with screen providers, manufacturers, and pen testers is advancing what's possible with security. And with us today, we have an incredibly distinguished panel of people we've been able to find who I'd like to have introduce themselves right now. We're going to start with Florence Hudson. Very good. Thank you so much, Mitch, for having me join you. And hey, Thank DEF CON you. crowd, geeks and all, um, and goons. So uh, I'm Florence Hudson, and I'm founder and CEO of FD Hint, which is an international consulting firm for advanced technology and diversity and inclusion. I also work for the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at Indiana University. I lead the Cybersecurity Research Transition to Practice Program. And I'm also executive director for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub at Columbia University, leading translational data science opportunities in the Northeast US. Oh, and I should say, I'm also working group chair for IEEE uh, UL P 2933 for those who aren't acronym queens and kings. Um, it stands for Institute for Electrical Electronic Engineers and Underwriters Laboratories, um, working group on creating a standard around clinical internet of things, data and device interoperability with TIPS, which stands for trust, identity, privacy, protection, safety, and security. And Mitch is one of our co-vice chairs. So thank you very much for having me, Mitch. Thank you, Florence. I'll take it over to Rob Suarez. Hi, hi, DEFCON. This is, uh, my name is Rob Suarez and I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for BD. That's Beckton Dickinson. And we're a global medical technology um, company offering some of the most advanced products across the continuum of care. Um, it's my job at BD to make sure that we are protecting uh, those, those products, that we're delivering a secure product, and also the environments in which they reside in, which is typically a hospital, but increasingly, um, you know, a patient bedside at home as well. And so I'm very excited to talk to my fellow panelists today about medical device cybersecurity. This is a passion of mine. And I've had the honor actually of, of working alongside Mitch and, and, and Michael as well on several industry initiatives. Um, and so again, looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Michael McNeil. Hi, DEF CON, this is Michael McNeil. I'm the Senior Vice President and Global Chief Information Security Officer at McKesson, and uh, just recently got to the organization, but as uh, you know, Rob has just stated, have had a number of years collaborating you know, with the team here, um, and my days go back into Philips as well as into Medtronic from a medical device perspective over the past 10 years. I'm really looking forward to this particular session. And again, have collaborated with these guys in a number of different industry and, and forums. And again, I think you'll find our conversations today to be pretty enlightening because it, it takes that ecosystem and for us to come together to really execute here. Thank you so much, Michael. So I'm gonna launch right into the first question here. First question is, what are the biggest concerns that each of you sees related to medical device security these days? So I'll start, if I might. Uh, so what I mentioned uh, when we were first opening up, I talked about TIPS, TIPS for the Internet of Things. This is a framework we've been creating with IEEE for four years now. As I mentioned, it stands for Trust and Identity, Privacy, Protection, Safety, and Security. I'm worried about all those things. <laughs> I'm worried about the trust and identity of the devices, the device to device communication, the device to human, the doctor to the device to the human, the human to everything. Um, so I'm concerned about trust and identity, how we're gonna maintain that and make sure we're vigilant about it. Uh, I'm concerned about privacy of data, whether you're in your home country or another country and what the different regulations are and how we're gonna manage it. I'm concerned about protection and safety how we're gonna keep the humans safe, how we're gonna keep the device safe, the infrastructure, the financial side of the institution. If your device is hacked and everybody finds out like some of the FDA and DHS and US CERT recalls, and I'm concerned about the cybersecurity. So we have a lot to do as the leaders in this space for IT and for cybersecurity and for medical devices. So I look forward to continuing the collaboration we're doing through groups like this, and also like in the IEEE working group where we have 
over 250 humans from 22 countries and six continents who were worried about this too, <laughs> including device manufacturers and providers and payers and regulators and everybody as we know, Mitch. So I'm worried about all that stuff. What about the rest of you? Are you worried? Uh, I, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll go next on, on that one. Thank you, Florence. I was, uh, I, you know, for me, it's actually very similar to what you'll find um, was reported out in, I believe it was 2017, and what was the Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Task Force report. In fact, uh, on that task force, I got to serve alongside Michael McNeil and several other individuals across the industry, and you know, produce a report that outlined observations and recommendations for improving cybersecurity across the industry in healthcare. And um, there was a specific section that was de uh, dedicated just for medical device cybersecurity. And I gotta tell you, that was three years ago. A, a lot of those uh, findings still apply to this day. And, and one that pops out to me immediately is that, you know, medical devices are in hospital settings for 15 to 20 years, but new cybersecurity threats emerge daily. And, you know, every hospital and every patient environment is unique. So there's no one size fit all approach. Um, and, you know, at BD, we, we're working closely with uh, healthcare providers on understanding uh, medical device cybersecurity as it exists out in a clinical setting out in the real world. And, um, and we're also working, we're really committed to transparency and, and, you know, and for example, you know, providing coordinated vulnerability disclosures on medical device uh, vulnerabilities. But, um, you know, unfortunately, it's, it, it's just not enough. There's, a, there's really a, a, a long time span to medical devices in these environments. And so, you know, tra increasing transparency absolutely helps, but we also need to build stronger relationships and stronger collaborations across uh, you know, Florence, as you really describe across the continuum of stakeholders that we have when it comes to uh, just using a medical device and managing it when it's in, in use. Yeah, and, and from my perspective, to, to build on, on what Rob has, has just stated, you know, he's, he's hit the nail on the head and we've been having these kind of conversations and discussions, you know, even before the 2017 and, and, and earlier when we, you know, <clears throat> go back a few few years on this particular topic. The, um, you know, I, I think people have heard me, you know, talk in the past and it, it really doesn't, you know, it's kind of interesting. It doesn't change. It just, you know, kind of perpetuates itself. So as Rob just talked about, you know, legacy devices as, as we call them and in the, you know, in the ecosystem and how we manage that you know, that to me ties right into what I've always said is, you know, sort of the three deadly sins that I've kind of communicated over time, you know, because you have these, these types of devices, you need to make sure that you can patch and update them in a timely manner. So one of the deadly sins, if I can't patch and update a, a device, I'm not going to be able to maintain the security of that solution out in the, the marketplace. Um, when I look at the types of devices and a number of them when they were designed and developed and they're in these environments, if they got hard coded credentials, those are the keys to the kingdom. If I open the keys up and I let anybody come in front, back, side doors, any way that you have, then you have access and you're going to be able to, to align. And then for us, when it comes to the type of information, you know, again, as, as I would say that Florence had talked about in terms of thinking of the type of data and the type of, you know, the information that needs to be held secure. If you don't do encryption and, and you know, de-identify and make sure that that's not available to cause the kinds of harm, you know, to individuals, to the solution itself, you know, you get to those deadly sins. So the sins are there and, you know, we're doing a much better job, I believe, in having an awareness around the design and how we need to, to build that into our solution set but it's how do you manage, you know, that, you know, that legacy, you know, that's sitting out there in the current environment, you know, and as, as we've also said sort of in the past, um, you know, because of the nature of the marketplace, you know, it, it's like, you know, prying those systems out of their cold dead hands, you know, in some of these, these, you know, these hospitals and other types of entities, 
because they don't have obviously, you know, with Mitch, the wherewithal, you know, to just immediately turn around, you know, your capital and your inventory for some of these types of solutions. Yeah, so I totally agree. It's, um, it's the products we have today. It's the new products and how we create design in plans so that you de design in a defense in depth level of security at the hardware, firmware, software and service level level. I suggest we go all the way down to the IP of the design of the chip. You know, we need to go all the way down and all the way up. And we also need, I know in the standards work we're doing, we're saying that we need to be able to look forward to. Um, I'm an old rocket scientist or experienced. My girlfriend's saying not to use the term old, but I'm an experienced rocket scientist. I used to work on future missions around Jupiter. Did we know exactly what we were doing? No, but we had a planet, you know, and you look forward, you say, what's going to happen? So in the standards work that we're doing, we're agreeing that it has to be a standard that is extensible into the future. You know, so what we're also doing is envisioning, well, how can we use it, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning better? What about when it's a hologram and the doctor's like, oh my gosh, She's right here. You look a little jaundiced. I'm like, how do you know that? You know, I'm in my pajamas. How did that just happen, right? So when we're in XR, AR, VR, how, how's all this stuff gonna play? And then if you wanna get excited about protocols, think of what, you know, communications protocol that's gonna be all about. <laughs> now that's gonna get into your EHR, EMR, or how they're gonna read, you know, from your, uh, from your little devices. So we're also trying to think of what could happen. So being an, an aerospace engineer, um, and designing, you know, um, not just spacecraft, but also planes and jets, you have your heads down display, right? Your altimeter, and then you have your heads up display. We need both. Yeah. I am in full agreement with you and can tell you the biggest challenge I saw with all these years of working for our healthcare and hospitals, I've been in the provider space for about a dozen years as a CISO, and the biggest challenge I've always found has actually been paying for it all because a lot, of, a lot of hospitals out there, especially with COVID, have significant financial challenges these days. And right now, I mean, every hospital has a problem paying. Before January or February of this year, you still would have had about, I'd say, about half the hospitals in the United States, whereby I asked them to update a good chunk of their clinical engineering equipment. They would have likely looked at me and said, when I can fix my roof, when I can fix my floor, and when I can patch the hole in the boiler. And what do you want? Do you want a roof over your head or do you want secure medical devices? And I've actually once had a clinical chair from a department sit me down and say, I'd, love, I'd like to update my devices, but I need to get different ones in here because I'm not able to do women's health properly. And it's to me, that put a lot of items in perspective and I've always worked with my customers to make sure that we can get them on at least a good path to where they need to be using minimal cost solutions because to be very blunt, it's 15 to 20 years also because that's all they have money for. And that's sadly yeah. the situation is in the United States and after things happen, after we have some leveling off with COVID, we're going to be in a much different place, more like 2009 when it comes to the economy. But to get these good items in place, you need to have standards. And that leads me to the second question, which is what standards efforts are in play for medical device security that you're currently working with? So again, over to you, Florence, because of all the IEEE work. Absolutely. And I have to apologize. I have a robocaller who won't give up. So you're going to hear my phone in the background. So anyone else been through this? Yep, hands up. So um, the standards efforts, uh, we have a number of standards efforts in play and we're trying to hold hands and work together. So at IEEE, we have this IEEE UL uh, P2933, which is the project for clinical IoT data and device interoperability with TIPS as we discussed. There are also efforts on blockchain for healthcare and how that plays in. There are efforts going on with ISO and IEC and uh, you know, open mobile health and communications interoperability. So we actually just had a really cool session last week where Mitch and I presented along with a number of our colleagues from around the world uh, regarding addressing clinical IoT interoperability and security challenges globally. And so one of our colleagues representing Underwriters Laboratories, after we each spoke about P2933, you know, this clinical IoT thing and then open mobile health and a few other things, he got up and said, okay, here's one page with like all this stuff on it. <laughs> you know, we have a pyramid here, we have a triangle and we have all these other pieces. 
we have to figure out how we're going to work together. So if any of you out there are interested in getting involved in this, we're actually hoping to have a longitudinal plan here. Um, we had Julian Goldman from Harvard um, and Mass General who was on the panel. At Ida Sim from UCSF. We had Mitch, me, Ken Hughes from Drager, um, Anura, um, Fernando from Underwriters Laboratories, and I always forget at least one. Oh, and Ken, well, Ken I think that's most of it. And so um, we're all going to be getting together again in the fall, and we're interested in anybody else who wants to join us. So Mitch, I don't know if we're giving out our email addresses or how you want to do that, but, um, you know, we can we just find a way. We'll find a way to make the P2933 web page completely accessible and get information over there. Okay. Get it get it out to people. So in the meantime, you can send me an email along with my robocaller at Florence at FDHint.com. And I think I'm gonna give them my email address so we're not so disruptive the next time. Cool. Hey, I, I just, uh, Florence, I'm really excited to hear that IEEE is getting involved in this space um and you know it, it's exciting to hear that there's not enough that we can do actually to really formalize the the process of medical device cybersecurity ac across the life cycle of these technologies um i would like to also recognize um you know a lot of the work that the fda has done in producing cybersecurity guidance documents over the last oh my gosh you know um many years. And, um, and so, you know, whether it's pre-market requirements for submissions and cybersecurity, or it's post-market surveillance, right, and, and knowing how to do coordinated vulnerability disclosures, those guidance documents are very helpful. Also, very relevant today, you know, is um, uh, cybersecurity for off-the-shelf uh, software components. Again, you know, FDA has some good guidance documents, on, on, a good guidance document on that. Um, recently, um, and you know, they've taken a very collaborative approach to cybersecurity and engaging very different stakeholders. And a great example of that is, you know, FDA has engaged NTIA on creating a software bill of materials um, um, a standard and a set of deliverables around that as well. And it's all around how manufacturers um, can be more ready to identify vulnerabilities in third-party components and then extending that capability out to hospitals you know, who have this technology in an operational environment. And, um, and you know, the last thing, I'll, uh, last two things here I'll mention is um, International Medical Device Regulators Forum. You know, it's not just the U.S. and FDA that's going through this problem. This is a global issue in, in medical device cybersecurity. And the International Medical Device Regulators Forum, INDRF, has come together to produce a cybersecurity guidance document that really sets to harmonize, uh, provide harmonized guidance to regulators globally. So, you know, uh, different countries and, and, and regions can set up their own guidance documents and, and map that to their own regulatory bodies. Um, and, and the last one here I'll mention, I have to mention it because, boy, uh, it was a lot of work, but the um, Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council and, you know, Michael, also, um, and Mitch, you know, uh, were contributors to this effort as well, produced what's called the Joint Security Plan, the MedTech Joint Security Plan, otherwise referred to as the JSP. And, you know, in this document, you know, anyone can find, it's not just, a, it's not a standard, it's actually a plan, a way to put in motion a security program from design, development, all the way out to you know complaint handling for medical devices and what to do when these devices are out on the field and risk management again throughout the the continuum of care so if you want to know how to do a risk assessment on medical devices if you want to know uh you know when to do a penetration test what types of design requirements are helpful for medical device and cybersecurity, how to structure your organization you know those things you can find in the jsp today and working with ndic we're, we're also developing an effort to actually benchmark against those different capabilities. So that way, if you're a small medical device manufacturer or a large one, you want to know where to go next and how to build out your program and what's good enough. And so this uh, benchmarking initiative with MDIC 
will help us create that that set of metrics and and again the benchmark itself so that we can share it openly across our industry stakeholders and collectively improve our programs, be able to speak to our executive leadership too as well, to have to pay and make and commit to this investment in medical device cybersecurity. That sounds really cool. Do they have guidance for manufacturers as well as providers? So uh, healthcare sector coordinating, uh, coordinating council provide, also has a, yes, guidance for healthcare providers too. It's called HICCP. HICP, and then you have the Joint Security Plan, uh, which is focused on medical devices and, and healthcare IT, uh, IT solutions. And so, yes, they have guidance for both, uh, both sets of stakeholders. Right, and, and yeah, so as Rob stated, the IMDRF also, the way it was documented, it addresses, here's what's the, the pertinent areas for the manufacturer, the health delivery organization, the different stakeholders, even patients, as it pertained to the different topics that was put into that type of guidance. And again, that one was was global. Um, a couple of others that I would just want to make sure that we have included, when you talk about um, health delivery organizations, MIDA has always championed and updated their you know, MDS-2 documentation, which is utilized for the procurement process with health delivery organizations. And that MDS-2 is something that has been maintained as a part of the release schedule and with the inclusion of the SBOM as a component and a deliverable of that, it gives organizations like Mitch's the ability of being able to understand the ingredients of the product and the solutions that they are acquiring and how they need to, to develop and execute that. And then as Rob said, the Amy organization has taken on the ability of taking a look at some of those, um, you know, uh, pre-market and post-market type of guidance documentation. And then they created their technical, you know, references in their TIR 57 and 97, which allows you to provide some of the how-to on those different stakeholders in the industry, how they need to execute against those particular um, technical references and, and standards. So I think that kind of, we gave you the alphabet soup and then some and in, in yeah. response, Mitch. <laughs> Absolutely. No and again, excuses now. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you that, that 2019 MDS2 form, thank you very much for that, Michael. That's been yeah. incredible in our organization. We've actually started using that a lot the first vendor that actually gave us one was phillips so very happy I'll, that i'll take the old pats on the back for that we're starting to get those in from our vendors and they've been helping us out with a lot of purposes so this is my next question here is what are the most difficult medical device security issues to solve i want to throw a real ringer in there so i'll take Mark, a first Okay, go ahead, Rob. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a first stab at that. So um, I think one of the most difficult issues to solve, just to change it up here, aside from, um, and it does relate to, you know, the issue of legacy medical devices, is also that hospital environments may have hundreds of thousands of connected medical devices at one time. And from, you know, thousands of different vendors. And so um, while I may not directly feel that pain, I feel for, I feel for our customers at, at BD that, you know, our healthcare providers and have to, you know, manage this tremendous complexity. And, you know, what compounds this situation is, you know, that not every medical device manufacturer is, you know, doing things like patching of of their medical devices or routine updates to their medical devices and also um you know um, that's why transparency is so important um because these you know new threats emerge daily and um and boy i'm sure there's a lot of homework that you know healthcare providers have to do when a new security vulnerability pops up and you don't find a timely and effective or meaningful communication from 
a, a medical device manufacturer to facilitate a response. So, um, so yeah, I think th those are really, really, you know, important issues that we need to address. You know, one of the things I would would add on where where Rob is at, and and again, I'll I, I do agree that the level of connectivity and the complexity of the the type of solutions is definitely you know a, a critical one. But let me be a little bit more provocative and throw something else out there. I think when you look at potentially, and again, you know, and this gets back to again, I, I think. Where, where Florence was at when we talk about taking it down to the chip level. When I, I think when I look at the greed that exists in, in society around, you know, the revenue that either wants to be made or maintained, you know, on, on devices, and then what that would be from your brand and an impression. I think one of the best things that happened was the fact when you know, the Health Sector Coordinating Council and, and HISAC and others have come together and petition organizations like Microsoft, especially during this time of COVID, to extend, you know, the patching and the updates for Windows 7 and to make that, you know, date in the hospital sector, you know, not, you know, you know, to extend it. So the more that we can do activities as a community like that to either extend the life or to be much more um, economical around how these you know, products and solutions are being used. And again, my provocativeness, get away from the potential greed that you know, might exist out there. I think that'll help us you know, to try to address you know, some of the, the issues that might exist you know, in the ecosystem as one thought. Say, you yeah, got so, yeah, greed and jealousy are um, motivators, you know, that we can use in business <laughs> to get people to do things. Um, and so there's always there. It's it's the human condition, I think. Um, so if we could figure out how to leverage that, I think that would be good. Um, so in the standards work that we do. You know, it's IEEE, it's at the individual level, it doesn't cost anything to join the working group. And what I tell people is, you know, this will be like a take home test if you get involved now, <laughs> because you can help define it, you know, and then you could be the first ones to have it. And you could be at the leading edge when, you know, I was at Yale New Haven a couple of years ago talking about this tips framework. And very bright as they are, um, the chief information and chief medical officers looked at me and said, so do you have a tips maturity model that you could hand us today that we could use tomorrow to look at all these hundreds of thousands of devices in our hospital and on our patients? I'm like, whoa, I wish the answer to that was yes, but it's going to take a village, right? Ah, the biohacking village. Look where we are. How handy is this? So maybe that's something, you know, we can end up working on together and people can get involved in creating this tips maturity model, validating it, certifying it. You know, maybe that's, you know, what we can do is get other people jealous, like, ooh, ooh, you know, I want to go to the head of the class. That would be great. I, uh, I agree with you. And I think, and again, there's other challenges as well. And I'm going to be just as provocative as Michael right here and bring out another big one, which is the electronic medical record systems of record themselves. So we have to make sure that these systems of record that we eventually store all this information in we have to make sure we keep them as updated and up to date and able to support these devices just as much as the devices themselves. There was actually an interesting paper I read from the late Michael Sino and some other people that had put together the bus model for electronic medical record system implementation at a health system in New Jersey they were at. And what it came down to is, is that 25% of the cost was the EMR 75% was the cost of the ancillary devices themselves. So I think we could stand to make sure that we have a good budgeting model, that we make sure that we understand what devices work, what version of an EMR, and be able to cost it all out. And we can solve that challenge with simply doing a lot of good financial work and making sure also that the system of record, AKA the EMR also stays updated easier said than done. 
So talking about challenge, other challenges for the future leads to question number four, which is how do you solve the challenges today with an anticipatory eye on what the next threats may be? It's on that right here. I'll start off again with Florence. So heads down display, heads up display. What is it you're trying to deal with today? And we have, we'll start with, with that. And we have to have the guts to look at what we haven't done yet. And we're all talking about standard this, you know, we haven't done a snowmed and low ink and this and that and firing it till seven. Oh my God, this stuff is so incredible because people who are brilliant who created it, right? But it's not done and it will probably never be done, right? Because there's a lot of hacking that, you know, continues to evolve as we know. Um, the, the bad dudes and dudettes and robots are just as smart as the good ones, unfortunately. So what we have to do is not be afraid to look at what haven't we done yet. So as an example, so we're talking about trust and identity and security and devices. So what if we had, you know, what if we figured out a federated identity management system for devices uh, with, you know, digital identifiers, decentralized identifiers, UDIs, and we try to do that globally. People go, oh, we haven't done that yet. I'm like, exactly. That's exactly the point. So is that exactly what we need? Maybe not. But go wide and then decide, you know, how we start today and where we need to go. So we have the guts. We have to have the guts to say we haven't figured it all out yet. Figure out what we can do today and then build a step function, you know, a plan going forward. And, you know, you should, we should do some brainstorming like I was about holograms and VR and AR and XR and your R and my R and all this other kind of stuff that's going to happen. And stuff that we don't even have terms for yet. They're going to be part of this. So I'd say that, you know, we have to start by being brave enough to understand what we already have from Amy and ISO and IEC and IEEE and all this other cool stuff and all the providers and all the manufacturers. Then look at what we haven't done yet. Have the guts to do that, figure it out, and then create a step function toward the future. So that's my recommendation. Yeah, I, I love the, the, the comments from, from Florence and, and the direction. Um, I've built a few homes because of having to, to relocate. And I always look at what your, your current environment is as, as an organization, as a team. And, and to her point, I want to make sure that foundation is in place. And when one of the biggest um, hurdles is to be able to consistently execute in a number of these organizations, you know, that foundational piece that she described, you know, in terms of making sure that we're doing consistently the activities and efforts that we should have in place right now. And so when you have, you know, multinational organizations, different business units, um, different variations of releases and schedules of, of products and devices, different mixes of, you know, solutions, whether or not they're, you know, capital related or implantables. And I mean, there, there's a myriad of things that, that exist out there, but you have to be pretty consistent with how am I developing that solution? How am I maintaining that? How am I updating that? How are we interacting and getting the right information at a consistent level like those MDS2s updated, you know, on that entire product portfolio? That's the basics in terms of the, of the blocking and tackling, you know, that usually isn't the most sexy thing that you think of and sometimes is, is really overlooked. And so we really need to get that foundational you know, areas in place across all of the elements of, you know, as we say in the ecosystem, you know, for devices and solutions. And even as, as Mitch just pointed out from, from his earlier statements around, you know, the electronic health and medical records, you know, Rob and I know that our counterparts in some of those entities, when we were on the cybersecurity task force, it was like pulling teeth to get them to want to even come to the table, you know, and having the discussions. And even when you have certain solutions where we're there was astonished to say, man, you had the ability to maintain the certain level of the release and not go back multiple, you know, inversions, but you did that to, to increase the, you know, to, to want to be supposedly, you know, in compliance and supporting your customers, but you were doing a total detriment to the industry by not aligning and forcing that you couldn't have stuff out there, but they were in a much easier position to maintain their devices at the most current levels and updates. And we were sitting there like, man, are you kidding? You know, because we don't have that luxury when it came to, 
you know, some of the devices, especially for organizations that, you know, had implantables, you know, and pumps and other things of, of those nature. So. Don't hold back, Michael. <laughs> it's de it's DEF CON. <laughs> so, so when I think about what we can do right now, um, I think about the current environment that we're in and it, it, you know, touches on a little bit of what you've heard from, from others on, on this panel, actually, you know, we're in an environment where I think most of our organizations, if you work in healthcare, we're distracted, really distracted. If you're even just the general public, you're distracted. Okay. COVID has taken a lot of the focus uh, away from other things like like cybersecurity. If if we're not careful in tying the story behind how cybersecurity is is the underpinning to providing a resilient and thriving healthcare system, it, it's just essential. We we can't we can't have resilient and an effective healthcare without securing it. Uh, they go hand in hand. And um, I say that because the other issue we're facing here is that, you know, most healthcare, uh, healthcare delivery organizations don't even have a single person dedicated to cybersecurity. And this is, this is uh, one of the findings of the Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Task Force report um, that went to uh, Congress in 2017. Um, so there's, there's not enough people working in this space we need to bring in more stakeholders from different backgrounds into the healthcare industry and into the cybersecurity industry uh, to, to really, and, and even if it's not their title, but to, to build a community of practice around everyone's shared responsibilities around cybersecurity. And, and the last thing I'll say from the stuff that we can control us, the cybersecurity professionals, I think um, especially, you know, Michael and, and Mitch and, and myself, we need to, as, as healthcare and medical technology companies, as healthcare providers, we need to look at our investment in security and ask ourselves this, are we protecting what society values most? And if you ask anyone, what is important to protect in healthcare, to protect, they will tell you most likely, even, you know, even if it's my mom, all right, she, she will tell you, it's probably going to be patient safety, patient health, right? And, and, and probably also patient privacy, you know? And so, you know, there's, a, so look at our investment today and figure out if there's changes that we need to take in our approach. And, and maybe touching on Florence's, uh, you know, idea there to make it even more tangible around creating some sort of model for identity management in, in healthcare, you don't have to go too far. I mean, there's, uh, for, for many years, the cybersecurity industry has been talking about what's called zero trust principles. And so the idea behind zero trust principle, principles are, you know, instead of trusting devices inside the network, you know, in this approach, it means trusting no one by default and operating as though the network had already been compromised. And, and so this means incorporating different types of criteria for authenticating and authorizing users. And the fundamental technologies exist today. It's just changing your strategy as a cybersecurity professional to focus on the idea that you've already been compromised. And how do we strengthen authentication through multi-factor authentication, through conditional access uh, for devices and users connecting to the network? Um, and, and so those types of technologies exist today. There is hope in, in again, what's available um, to, to cybersecurity professionals today. But I would also go back and say, we need to expand our community practice. So if we get all geeky weeky, which we could do with each other, fire this and HL7 that, and we're so cool and this, that, and, you know, trust zone and hardware we to trust, they'd be like, whoa, I was sitting next, uh, I got upgraded for free one day on a plane when I was flying planes. And I was sitting next to a guy who runs a hospital, a doctor, and I was telling him what we're doing. He said, well, you know what? I'm glad you're working on that because my job is to keep that patient on the table alive. That's what I focus on all day. So in our in our working group, our IEEE P2933 and the EO working group, actually, it's all about, we always talk about it, protecting the humans. 
keeping the humans alive. That's why we're doing this. That's exactly why. You know, my background, my mother died the day I was born. It was a medical error. You know, whole stuff to hear. So I carry this with me. How do you keep the humans alive? And that's what we're focused on. And if you actually read our project authorization request at IEEE, it says to improve health outcomes. We're not doing this for us geeky weekies. We're doing it to improve health outcomes and to keep the humans alive. And eventually what I would love to see, and we actually had a meeting um, in my last firm and with Microsoft a few years ago, we were talking about creating like a cybersecurity learning hub for humans, you know, normal people. And we said, oh, cradle to grave. And we said, ah, that's kind of rude. Let's say pre-K to AARP. And we're going to teach them what TIPS is. You know, so when I was a little girl, remember, I'm a geek. I was a rocket scientist. So I used to look for the little UL tag on my on my electric cords. Any of you guys? I did. I always look for them because that meant safety, right? And so what we want to do is teach them why they should ask for this. So someday, I don't know if it's two, three, or five years from now, some little five-year-old is going to be at the doctor, and they're going to try to give her an insulin pump, and she's going to say, does that have tips? And she doesn't need to know what it stands for. We do. We're the geeks. We need to understand that it's trust and identity and federated identity management. And when the doctor, you know, goes into the little device next to grandma's bed that goes into her implanted pacemaker, you check the credentials of that doctor every single time. You make sure they're still, you know, related to whatever their provider is. You make sure they still are credentialed. You make sure it's really the doctor and you have to figure out how to do it. So that's our vision is that we really want this to protect the humans and make the humans aware of it. Just like I looked for that little UL tag, which not everybody did, I know, but you know, how do we teach them? And then make sure that the manufacturers are delivering that because then you have demand, you have push and pull from the citizens, from the patients, right? And then the providers and the payers should care about this. It reduces their liability. You know, I used to work on smart buildings years ago when we were first creating the smart building strategy when I was a VP at IBM. And I remember, you know, we were talking to these building management system companies and one of them said, oh, you know what? Security is like number 11 on my list of top 10 things to worry about. And their device was hacked nine months later and the whole leadership team was out. And now it's part of their brand promise. Oh, imagine that, right? So we need to make that a requirement. You know, we need people to be incented uh, to do that and to have the citizens and patients asking for it. Absolutely, Florence. And also one other thing that my organization's had a big challenge with has also been privacy because one of the areas we've got to worry about is not only do we have, we're collecting all this data on people and we have numerous data points on all of the people we're collecting from these devices. And we need to make sure that we're protecting that. So important question I have here is what about privacy? How are we incorporating this into our products? How are we incorporating it into our data governance plans? So lead off here, I believe it's gonna be our final question for the, th for the three of you. So, start off with Michael. Sure. I, I think that the, um, you know, privacy takes on, you know, from a legal perspective, you want to understand, you know, the, the requirements by the different geographies, by the different jurisdictions, by, you know, what the hospitals and, and the, you know, the different entities have in terms of managing that type of information. But to me, Mitch, it's, it's, it's nothing more than another component of your requirements. So if you design privacy as you would security by design in your development process, you take into account what are those sets of requirements. And you have to harmonize for, you know, some of us, you know, like, you know, Rob and I and others out there that deal in multi, you know, geographies, you know, multi types of, of regulatory and compliance environments and you have to develop what your baseline is. And then once you develop that baseline and you include those sets of requirements, I would look at the steward of, you know, the CISOs, you know, and there's three of us on the call to be able to make sure that we're executing against that. We go to our legal teams and the privacy organization really for that foundation to make sure that we're interpreting those requirements and we're executing those requirements you know, effectively with the tools and the solutions that we then deploy out in the, in the marketplace. And so 
I have always had, you know, a, kind of a mix of the privacy and, and the data protection elements kind of be able to be commingled within, you know, the team operationally. If you do it right, you want the CISO side of the house to be managing that and you want your legal and your compliance arms to be able to help you develop and, you know, and, and document what those requirements need to be, you know, from a privacy perspective, in my opinion. Uh, so I got to tell you, I don't think I could describe it any better than Michael, or I should say Professor McNeil. Um, uh, that was, it, it, it's so well said, really. I can't, I can't do better than that. I, I mean, you know, to, to address privacy requirements alongside security requirements, I absolutely agree. As security professionals, like, you know, bring your privacy friends along with you. Um, and absolutely right that, you know, there's things that, you know, we think of in security that sometimes are counterintuitive to privacy and, and then also, you know, vice versa, actually. And so I, I do like, again, what Michael said around, you know, bring, you know, treating, uh, bring in your legal professionals, especially, you know, when you're addressing privacy requirements, the complexity is, as he mentioned, this is different across every single country. And, and you do have to, you know, establish as a company, a common foundation uh, based off of values, based off of values and principles, you know, as a company, what do we stand for? What is it that we want to do when it comes to this civil rights issue, uh, you know, of privacy? Um, and if it, and sometimes that means we want to do everything that we can and we are going to establish, you know, the strictest, you know, governance of privacy across all of our technologies and product platforms, you know, that is, again, a decision that companies need to make. And I got to tell you, I don't think there's many customers that would complain, you know, about, about a company creating a position and a very robust and comprehensive position on privacy across their different technologies for customers, so. Agreed. So I'll make a couple I of comments. I'm sorry, Mitch. couldn't you agree more with you. So what do you think, Barnes? Oh, you know me, I, I always think something. So there are a couple of things. Um, one is on the privacy side, it's one of our subgroups, it's part of TIPS, you know, Trust Identity Privacy, right in the middle, Protection, Safety, and Security. And we have a woman from the European Union who's leading that subgroup, which is great, because she actually found the privacy rules by country in Europe. Not surprising, right? So what we're doing is making sure that we're going deep on those, identifying the patterns, and then figuring out what are the little things we have to worry about here if we're creating a standard that's international, so if I'm wearing an implanted device, I'm in the US, I'm in the UK, I'm in Russia, I'm in China, I'm in South Africa, am I gonna be safe? You know, is my data gonna be private? What does that mean? What are the implications? So we're already baking that in um, to the plan. The other thing is um, that I was at an event um, at my alma mater at Princeton and Sonia Sotomayor was there. Uh, she's a Supreme Court justice in the US for those of you who don't know her, she's brilliant. And so I asked her, what do you think about privacy and security and the internet of things, all these devices all over the place? I said, I'm working on security. She said, that's good because I'm working on privacy because I don't think the citizens realize the human rights that they're giving up. Very interesting. So she's on it and she's already written a couple of things on it if you want to look at what she's done. Um, and then the other thing I just want to mention very quickly, we were talking about, you know, what's our goal here. I spoke at an event at an Academic Medical Center conference a few years ago. And then about a year or so ago, a gentleman reached out to me and said, oh, I wrote a book and I found your presentation and I refer to you in my book. I was like, oh, I'm so honored. What's the name of your book? The Doctor Will Kill You Now. <laughs> and he talked about the security and privacy issues and this guy who like, you know, lives in his mother's basement and then moves to another state. It's not bad living in your mother's basement. I have that going on too, but moves to another state, fakes a PA license, gets into a doctor's office, gets into the system, actually turns off the power in the hospital. So someone on event dies. Then he gets into somebody's personal medical record changes his blood type, they're given a transfusion and they die. And then his next target is a children's hospital. So if anybody is looking at, so why should I worry about this security and privacy stuff? 
that's a good book. It's only 15 bucks. And the guy who wrote it is an MD. And he used to lead the IEEE chapter in Rochester, New York years ago. <laughs> so he, you know, he's on both sides. He's an electrical engineer, computer scientist, more double E. And then, um, and then he's also a doctor. So we all have to work on this. This is serious. It's just going to get worse. Um, a lot more things are connected. There are attack surfaces all over the place. We need a defense in depth strategy. Um, and it's for privacy and security and protection and safety. And impressed by the depth of knowledge everyone brings here. And I speak from the provider perspective here. I'm very happy to be working with you all, especially from the standards perspective as well. I think we have a good foundation. We just all need to continue to keep working together. And you have my commitment and for all of you in the medical device industry, you know you have my organization's commitment as well. So thank you so much for all taking the time today. This is incredibly appreciated and hope all of you out, out there appreciate this today as well. So again, thank you all so much for taking the time. And this is the group here signing off.